modern educational systems are good at training us how to be skilled at what we're already talented at. They figure out where your propensities lie, where your skills lie, where your talent lies, and they'll channel you in that direction. They're not very good at teaching us how to develop skills in areas where we're not talented. And there are some skills that, for our own well-being, we all have to learn whether we're talented or not. Meditation is one of those skills. Some people find it easy, other people find it hard. But just because it's hard doesn't mean that you shouldn't be going in this direction, because this is a skill that everybody needs. It's a skill that gives us a sense of refuge, a real refuge, to protect us when the body ages, when it grows ill, when it dies, when we're separated from those that we love. We all want happiness, but we've got to face these things in life. We have to learn how to deal with them in such a way that we don't suffer. That's what the meditation is for. As the phrase goes, pain is normal, but the suffering is optional. Physical pain is going to be there for everybody, one way or another. Last night we got some analgesic from Brazil. And one of the monks was mentioning uh, you know, the occupational hazards of being a monk is you've got to put up with pain. Well, it's the occupational hazard of being born as a human being. As we get older, we find that the parts of the body that used to work really well aren't working quite so well anymore. The parts that we didn't really notice suddenly announce their presence by being painful. And those are just the beginning warnings. When real illness sets in, when aging sets in, the further warnings. At some point we're going to have to face the pain of death. The body's going to be a, an area where we don't want to be. We can't be here anymore. It's like being evicted. And so what are we going to do then? If the mind hasn't been trained, it loses all sense of security, all sense of safety, and we'll just grab at whatever comes by. But if it has the sense of well-being inside, when it has a place where it knows that it's quiet and that there's an awareness that's not going to be touched by all this other stuff, then we're safe. Now you have to take this as a working hypothesis. The Buddha can't show you nirvana first to prove that, yes, this really does work. But we've looked at all the other possibilities in the world, and they, they don't seem to match this one, because this is actually a skill you can work on. No. It's not a skill that's easy to develop for everybody. Some people find the concentration easy, but then the discernment is hard. Other people find the discernment easy, but the concentration is hard. Some people find both sides hard. So we have to have a way of reinforcing our conviction until we begin to see the results. Then the results themselves begin to become fuel for our further practice. But you look at the Buddhist teachings, they're reasonable all the way along. He's not asking you to believe impossible things. He's just asking you to realize there are certain areas where you don't know. But you know that if you take this on as a working hypothesis, hypothesis the belief that the mind can be trained, because then it's possible to do it. And the extent to which you can get all the way there. That doesn't matter nearly as much as your conviction that, yes, this can be done and I can do it. That gives you a real leg up right there. So if you find the mind wandering off from the breath, just keep bringing it back. Wanders off again, bring it back again. And do your best not to get discouraged. Remember, you've been 
training the mind to wander for who knows how many lifetimes. That's what the word samsara means. It's the wandering on. We tend to think of samsara as a place, but actually it's a process, it's something the mind does, and it creates worlds as it wanders. It's the wandering that creates the worlds. It's not the worlds that are there first and you wander into them. You keep creating the worlds for yourself, first through your thoughts, then through whatever you grab onto as you die from one life and go into the next. So this is a habit we've developed really, really well. This is something we are good at, at least to some extent. It's just going to take a while to resist those old habits and develop new ones in their place. So learn to be able to smile at yourself and have a good sense of humor around all the tricks that the mind plays. And you can get past the difficult patches, and you find that there will be easy patches as well. They alternate. It's not like it's always going to be hard. It's just in the very beginning it seems pretty discouraging. But as you stick with it, stick with it, stick with it, things get better and better. And they get worse for a while, but then you say, okay, that's just part of having a mind. The mind's very complex. As you said, it's like a committee. And you get some members that will go along for a while, and all of a sudden they'll start falling away and wandering away. And other members that have been quiet for a long time suddenly come in again. It's like one of those graphs that generally moves up, but it does have its little valleys here and there. So if you find yourself in a valley, remind yourself, okay, there, there is a way up. Because this is a necessary skill. We've died we don't know how many times, and we've suffered we don't know how much for all that. Every time I drive up five, look out across the ocean, and remember what the Buddha had to say about all the tears that we've shed, all the blood that we've shed, more than there is water there in the ocean. And you look out, that's a pretty big ocean. When you fly over it, you realize how much bigger it is than you can see. And so you realize the importance of working on this skill and not letting yourself get discouraged. There's that story they tell about the, the Englishman who went across the Northwest Territories back in the 1800s. He was the first Englishman to entrust himself to the, the Dene, or any of the Native Americans. But there was a band of Dene Indians who were going to go across. So he went with them. And he noticed on the days that when they couldn't get any game, when there was no food, and they had to tighten their belts more, those were the days that they joked one among one another the most to keep their spirits up. And so as you go through the difficult passages, you've got to figure out how can you keep your spirits up as you go along. And realize it's this barren passage. Passages are not all that bad. You can work with them. You can live through them. It's your own tendency to come down on yourself. That's the most difficult part of all this. So you've got to learn that, turn around, check that, and look at that. And realize you don't have to believe that member of the committee. This is where the committee image comes in useful again. Just because a voice is going through your head doesn't mean that you have to claim it as your voice. or that you have to believe it. Just notice that it's there, but you can learn to ignore it. And keep reminding yourself this is a skill that really has to be mastered regardless of how easy or hard it is. So think over your life about the things that did not come easily, but you learn how to do them anyhow. And ask yourself, how did you do that? Usually you're focused either on how much you wanted the results or how much you were afraid of what would happen if you didn't master the skill. And then you learn how to channel both the desire and the fear into 
practical action. And ask yourself, what did you do to maintain yourself, to keep yourself going even when things didn't seem all that easy? This is why, as the Buddha said, it's the generating of desire is an important part of right effort, upholding your intent. Any mental activity that helps you, stick with it, stick with it, stick with it. It's going to bear fruit. Now the fruit may come slowly or quickly. It's not like a tree where you can calculate, okay, that's got another how many weeks before the fruit's going to be ripe. The mind isn't that simple. But the basic principle is always there. The more good energy you put into this, the more you're going to get out. Whether it's quickly or slow, you have to teach yourself that's not the issue. The issue is you've got some good energy here, put it in. More good energy, put it in. You can't find any energy, look for it. Put that into your thoughts and your words and your deeds. And the results are sure to come. As the Taya Johns keep saying, don't doubt this. This does work.